All right, everybody, welcome back to the Library of Things collab. We are grateful to have you join us again for another session. Um, as always, this session is being recorded. We will be sharing the recording, um, both the video, um, the, the slides that are presented, and also the transcript um, within the next couple of days. We post those things to Canvas. And maybe, Candice, if you can go ahead and put the, the link to Canvas in there. Um, that's where we're maintaining all the different resources in this course. Um, eventually, in the currently being developed, is going to be a library of things uh, toolkit, um, which we will have later in the fall. Um, and so we will be kind of taking all of the resources that have been presented and all and all the videos and everything from the the past uh, few months and put, wrapping that all into a toolkit you'll be able to reference and, and share and use moving forward. Um, if you notice on the um, the list of participants, you'll see a few of us have pizza slices before our names. Those are uh, members of the shareable team. If you have any questions or need any support during this uh, collab session, feel free to send a direct message to one of us and we will help uh, you with some technical assistance as needed. Uh, and then at the end, um, the presentation is going to run through the hour. Um, we'll leave the room open for another 10 or 15 minutes in case anybody wants to continue to chat as we go. So uh, today we have the first of a two-part uh, session on fundraising. And um, today we're going to be focusing on kind of crowdfunding and other online um, campaigns um, next month. We will be focusing on grants, on you know where to find them, how to apply, uh, what to do once you get them, um, and and how to make sure you're in compliance. And so that'll be the second part of this training. Uh, but today on digital fundraising, we are fortunate to be joined by uh, Liana Frick and Darren Cotton, who have both presented to us before. And without further ado, I will hand it off to you two. Thanks, Tom. Um, I'll kick us off since I'm going first. I'm Liana. I use she her pronouns. I'm a co-director at the Station North to Library. I'm also a certified fundraising executive and a fundraiser by trade, um, although my real heart is in sharing economies. So, uh, Darren, do you want to hop in and say hi? Sure. I'm um, just realizing I didn't plug this into the title under my photo, so apologies, uh, but executive director at the Tool Library in Buffalo, uh, he, him pronouns, uh, started the tool library back in 2011 as a grad student um, and just have recently transitioned into a paid full-time position at the organization. So um, development is development and fundraising is one of the, the many hats um, that I wear at the organization. Oh, um, so I'm going to go over some basics. This first three units are, are an overview about digital fundraising specifically. And then Darren is going to tell us about all how he did it and how he was successful. Um, and this is obviously not comprehensive. It's a crash course. And we're focusing on online fundraising. There's lots of other kinds of fundraising to do, obviously, including grants. But generally, some things to think about if you are considering launching an online campaign. There's lots of kinds of online campaign, but there's some commonalities. So before you do any fundraising, grant writing, um, in-person events, any of that stuff, you want to set your goal, right? And that is not just how much money you want to raise, although that is important, um, but it's how much you really need to do your thing. And then maybe how much extra you could use to do a stretch goal. Uh, and then in a lot of specificity, what are you fundraising for? So this might seem obvious until you start to write it down, uh, but the more specificity you can get to earlier, the better. That's going to be a big theme today. Think about when you need the funding by. You might need a certain amount by this date and then the rest by that date it might be rolling. You might need it all up front. And then this is a really important question as you start to think about communicating with your donors is what will be different as a result of raising this money? Um, so not just, you know, what are you gonna buy? Um, what are you gonna pay for? But what will be the impact? What's the effect on your community, on people's lives? Um, so really starting to think about that visionary version of the goal that you set. And that really comes into storytelling. So, so much of fundraising is effective storytelling. Um, so if you can talk and write 
about what you are fundraising for in a way that is passionate and compelling and clear, you're going to be successful as long as you're talking to the right people. That's another option, uh, uh, another topic. So when you think about answering this question, what will be different as a result of raising this money? You are articulating a clear vision, right? Not um, this would happen or this might, this will happen. When we raise this money, this will be the result. And you want to illustrate your plans with text and images. Um, there has been a little bit of research in the crowdfunding world about the fact that videos that are less polished, that are more DIY, actually perform better. Um, so don't worry too much about making your graphics perfect, about getting high production value on your videos. iPhone photos and um, cell phone videos are fine. Uh, people really want to know that there's a real person behind the campaign creating this stuff. So don't get too bogged down on it. But as they say, a picture does is worth a thousand words. So think about how you're going to graphically illustrate your vision for the future. As much as you can, it is more successful when you can focus on the positive. So there are two ways to approach this, deficit-based and asset-based. Um, when you talk about the deficit, you know, if we don't get this money, this terrible thing will happen is how a lot of um, political fundraising happens, you might have noticed. But outside of politics, it is, it is a lot less successful. So if you can focus on the positive, when we raise this money, this amazing thing will happen. You know, even if it is, we will be able to keep the lights on. If you frame it in the positive, people will be more inspired and they're more likely to stay with you in the long run if they're not responding to a crisis or an emergency. But you do want to point to your past successes. So although your story should be about the future, you're also sort of making a pitch to investors in a way. They're investing in your vision. So you want to prove to them that you know what you're talking about, that you will be able to use this money effectively. Um, you can say, you know, this um, workshop that we have run was so successful. It was overbooked. There's so much demand. We want to offer it five more times and we want you to fund it. Um, so if you can build on your past towards that future, it's going to be more successful as well. And then this is a, a key maxim in fundraising is that people don't give to organizations. People give to people. And whether that is you as the fundraiser that they believe in, uh, a crowdfunding team member who they love and want to support, the membership of your library, um, you know, if you can say with this money, we're going to be able to put 20 more rakes in the hands of people who are maintaining our neighborhood, um, or we're going to be able to offer this workshop to 10 more people, that is going to be more effective than talking about something amorphous like, you know, we're going to meet our organizational budget. That's great. People don't care. People care about people and animals, but that's not relevant here usually. All right. So once you've figured out your story, um, you know why you're fundraising, you have your elevator pitch, you have a quick video or some images, you wanna think about the logistics, right? How are we actually gonna do this thing? Um, we use an online platform called Give Butter. Um, I'm gonna show you some examples that are on two different platforms, um, Give Butter and Indiegogo. There are a million out there. It doesn't matter too, too much which one you pick, but it should be user-friendly. Um, it should offer you uh, a streamlined sort of like pretty opportunity for people to give and it should just be easy to use. That's the most important thing. Easy to use and cheap or free. Give Butter is um, free. I don't work for them. I just love them. It's a great product. Uh, there are a couple of different ways you can structure your online landing page, right? When you say go to this link and give us money, that can be a crowdfunding page where lots of different people are getting people to go to that page and give to their specific team. I'll show you some examples of that. It can just be a regular donation form. And this could be your form you use for everyday giving. It can be a specific form for a specific cause, which I'll show you an example of. Um, it could be embedded in an event. It could be, a, you know, sort of just like a, a gateway to give a gift. And if you're having an event, there is the opportunity to collect donations through buying tickets um, or RSVPing for an event. So. Think about all the different ways that you can direct people to a link to give. Um, and the, the majority of gifts do happen online. And even the people who give via check or stock transfer often are being prompted by a digital invitation these days. Um, and this is a really good tip that Darren threw in there because I forgot it. Um, 
if you have people coming through your space who are going to see you in person, you can still direct them to an online giving page and a QR code that people scan with their phones is a really easy way to do that. Um, while you might be running an online campaign, make sure that there are lots of different ways to give. Um, PayPal and Venmo are integrated into a lot of giving platforms now. Um, so GiveButter does accept PayPal and Venmo. Um, you can set up a PayPal.me for your organization. Just be aware of the fees. They can add up if you have a bunch of different platforms. Um, but make sure that people know where to send checks. So if somebody is giving a really large gift, um, you want to save them that 3%, 5% credit card processing fee by giving them an opportunity to write you a check instead. It's free for everyone. Um, and often if someone's dropping off a check or mailing a check, it's a really good opportunity for you to thank them in person um, or to mail them back a card. So it's a little bit more personal when someone gives you cash or checks in person. Um, and then again, if you are selling tickets or you're selling anything else and there's the opportunity to add um, an optional donation, just do it. Just turn it on. People will give you money. Um, and then you want to plan ahead for recognition. So make sure that you're capturing how people want to be recognized. If they want to be anonymous, um, think about who's going to send those thank you emails. You're going to do thank you cards. We talked about this in our earlier fundraising, so the stewardship part of this. So I would go back to Canvas um, if you want more details there. All right. If you are doing um, a set campaign, like a capital campaign or a crowdfunding campaign, which is to say you have a specific goal with a deadline and you're raising money to do a thing at a specific time. So that could be buying a building. It could be adding tools to your library. It could be, we just do this at the end of the year, every year we have a two month annual campaign. Um, there are some bonuses that can make it more fun and encourage people to give. So you probably have seen challenge grants or matching grants. That's really common. What I do is uh, every sort of like larger gift throughout the year that I talk to someone about, I say, would you like to double this? Like, would you like to make a pledge now um, that at the end of the year, you will match donations so that it encourages other people to give? Or it could be, you know, if we get 30 new donors, if we um, raise $50,000, we'll get an additional 10,000. Lots of ways to structure it, and it can be pretty informal on the matching donor side. Um, but people typically tend to get excited about the idea that their gift could go further in inspiring other gifts. And matching challenges still work pretty well. Um, so you are going to raise more money if you if people get the sense that it's going to help you unlock other money they're more likely to give. Um, the other three on this list. I am a little bit less fond of because they are transactional. And so while somebody might make a gift to get something in exchange, um, they're less likely to make a gift again because they, that was like a tit for tat. Um, but they can be very effective and some people will continue to give. So you can do raffles and prize drawings. Um, we do a week every year during our annual campaign where we have handmade gifts um, made by our volunteers and every donor, every donation is an entry to win. Um, so if you donate to multiple campaigns, it's multiple entries, and we draw a name every day and give them a gift. Um, you can also do donors only swag, like stickers that people can put on their car. This is the NPR tote bag uh, technique. Um, you can add their name to a public list or an item like a brick in a sidewalk, uh, a rung in a ladder, something like that. People can name things by giving. And then you can also have competitions among your fundraisers. So you might say like, the volunteer who raises the most money um, gets a gift card for a dinner that was donated by a local restaurant, something like that. All right, and speaking of your fundraising team, whether or not you're crowdfunding, you need people to help you. Um, if it's just you asking for money, you can ask, you know, however many people are in your network or you have emails for. But we're gonna get to this in a second. The more people are involved, the more people they know personally, the more people are going to get a really compelling ask. So build your team early, um, provide them a comprehensive toolkit with templates. I'm going to show you ours. You can just snag it, adapt it. Um, and then you want to train them on your strategy and the story. So you spent all that time talking about what will be different. Make sure they know that and make sure that they have their own version of that story that they can tell people. And then you want to incentivize them and celebrate them. They're doing important work for you. This is a really critical way to volunteer. And your program volunteers are some of your best ambassadors because they're already giving their time. They know how important the organization is. They know it inside and out. 
Um, so if you can get them on board as fin fundraising cheerleaders, you're already part of the way there. All right, so I mentioned our fundraising toolkit. I'm just gonna give you a quick glimpse. This is still live on our website. It's not linked because we're not in fundraising season. Uh, right now, we're not in our annual campaign season, um, but the URL is here and um, I can put all this stuff in the chat later, but feel free to grab any of this from our website that is helpful. Um, you can see we have a, a downloadable toolkit. So this is PDFs of all this stuff. Um, how to create a fundraising page on our platform. It's pretty straightforward, but giving people a guide really helps. Sample messaging. These is our past successes that I mentioned. So this is stats that people can draw on. So last year, you know, we had this many members, we loaned this many tools. And then we used Canva, which is a free graphic design software to create templates that people could um, access, create their own version for social media. And then we have some sample emails. We also, and this is this is really kind of for our internal volunteers. We have about 80 volunteers, so um, we have a pretty good team, but you can you can also recruit members, you can create, recruit family members, anybody. Um, I always like to give people a couple different ways to opt in that are very straightforward, right? So that the top extra all in, we have like two or three of these people every year who go all out. They make a fundraising page, they throw a dinner party, they like create their own raffles, like all this stuff. Um, all the way down to the bottom, which is like, I don't want to participate, but I'll help. Um, then that's how we get our gifts for our handmade raffle. Um, so this, I find, create your own version of this for your community, but giving people concrete ways to opt in that, that are meaningful um, is really helpful. All right. And you might be thinking like, how am I going to get these people to ask for money? Asking for money is scary. We hate it. No one wants to talk about money. It's not true. There's lots of us that do this all day, every day. And this is my best tip for training board members, volunteers, crowdfunders who are nervous about asking people for money. And that is just to remember the last time that you, especially if you were asked to, gave to someone or something that you care about. How did it feel? I've asked this question maybe a hundred times. The answer is never, I hated it. It was terrible. I regretted it. Everyone is always really happy to support something that they care about. And not everyone you ask is going to care about it. But the people you ask who do are going to feel great about supporting you. And that's the thing to remember is you're not taking anything from anyone. You're giving them the opportunity to have this great feeling that you have had in the past. So that's an important framing, I think. And I offer that to you. It's a, it's a valuable question. So then how do you make the ask? Just a couple of tips here. Um, when you train fundraisers or when you go out to fundraise, the instinct is always like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it on Facebook. I'm going to put it on Instagram. I'm going to make a TikTok and be like, here's the link. Give. Doesn't work. It doesn't work. People don't. People see asks and ads and stuff like that on social media all the time. The first couple of years that we had Giving Tuesday, it was effective and it has not been since then. Um, so working from, from the bottom, a social media post or even a bunch of social media posts encouraging people to give is almost never going to get you a significant number of gifts. Um, a mass email. So like if you send out your annual news or your monthly newsletter, whatever, sending out a version of that that's about giving, it's going to get you some, it's probably people who were planning on giving anyway, and it's the reminder that they needed. If you send a direct email, even if it's like a mass merged email that comes from your email address, um, you know, you put it, you merge in their first name, it feels a little bit more personal, but you don't really know them, but it's going to be a little bit more successful. If you send an email to the 20 people who are in your address book, who, you know, love you, owe you a solid, love what you do, whatever, and you say, hey, gang. I'm doing this thing. I'm fundraising for new shovels. Um, please give us $25. I would really appreciate it. That's going to be almost the best thing you can do. Asking people in person is still the most effective way to get a gift. And it also feels the most awkward, but it's exactly the same as emailing them because the worst they can say is no. Literally the worst that someone, unless you really misjudge your relationship, the worst they can say is, mm, I don't think so. Not right now. Um, you're not asking for yourself. That's the important thing to remember. You're asking for these other people. And so it's going to be actually a lot less awkward in person than you think. 
And again, specificity is the soul of fundraising. So be specific about the amount you're raising and why. So if you can say, um, you know, of this $30,000 goal, $10,000 is going to go to new tools and repairs. Then people who really care about borrowing new tools is going to be like, cool, I'm going to contribute to that goal, even though it's the same thing. And you want to talk about what the money will be spent on and how much each dollar amount will accomplish. So um, in a lot of um, places, you'll say like a gift of $25 covers a uh, replacement battery. It doesn't, it's like a hundred. Um, you know, uh, a gift of $50 covers the materials for this workshop. Having people have a sense of exactly what their money will do helps them feel more confident about giving the gift and also makes it feel more meaningful to them. And then asking people for a specific amount of money, even if it's not the most that that person might give you, really, really helps. There's this psychological phenomenon that when you have to make a choice, especially a choice about something that has social impact, which is like, is this enough? Is this the right amount? How much do they expect me to give? Causes psychological pain. And so if you just say, hey, Aunt M, if you have 50 bucks to contribute to this campaign, it will, you know, buy us materials for this workshop so that we can offer a scholarship. And M is going to be so much more likely to give you 50 bucks because you asked for 50 bucks. It's just easier that way. Um, the average online gift of a crowdfunding campaign used to be 20 to $25. It's going up. Um, I would say if you have no idea what this person's capacity is to give, 40 or 50 is a pretty safe place to start. Um, and you could give them three options. You could say 25 will do this, 50 will do this, 100 will do this. All right, so that's everything you've ever needed to know about fundraising. I'm just kidding. It's just a little bit, but I did want to pause before we turn it over. Uh, we're going to go through a couple of examples and then turn it over to Darren. We're also going to have time for Q&A at the end. We haven't seen very many okay. questions in the, in the chat. Um, but if anybody wants to just come off mute for a moment. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, sure can. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I'm wondering, you mentioned, um, you know, speak to your past successes. I'm wondering if you're just starting out, you don't actually really have any of those. What do you recommend mm -hmm. in that situation? That's okay. You don't necessarily have to, if you can really lean harder on the specificity of your vision, it will give people a similar sense of confidence that like you have planned this out, you actually will be successful if you get this money. Um, and I'll show you a campaign example from a new tool library that I think did that really well. Thanks. Yeah. I also would say, you know, pulling back the curtain and saying like, here are the people involved and why they're awesome and what they've done in the past even if it wasn't for this library, if you feel really confident about the team that's getting your library things off the ground, talk about them, put up their pictures, you know, uh, help people understand why they're gonna be successful. Okay, well, feel free to put more in the chat. We will have time at the end. Uh, oh, Kate. Oh yeah, <laughs> yes, Kate points out that you uh, you should make sure that you are in compliance with your state rules and regulations about fundraising. Um, each state has different charitable registration rules. Most of them require you to tell the state, um, either the state attorney general or another office that you are fundraising. Um, so definitely Google like how to fundraise in your state uh, and make sure that you've done the appropriate filings. It can take a while. So that's a really good thing to get started on actually first before you set any goals or anything like that. Um, and make sure that you have an entity there to receive the money. So go back to session three and the collab about operations. And there's some different ways to structure your entity, but don't, don't have it go into your bank account. You will have to pay income taxes on it. All right, let's look at some examples. So um, I've talked about a couple different ways that you can set up online fundraising campaigns. This was our most recent event. Um, so again, with GiveButter, you can um, give people the opportunity to donate along with a ticket. Um, we have found that if there are like free drinks or free events or like free activities that we advertise, people are much more likely to give us money because they're like, oh, well, I mean, it's I'm going to have like a free fun time. I might as well kick some money their way. Um, so you can see we had about 100 people attend this event. We raised about 430 bucks. Um, 
this is a pretty straightforward way to raise some money and also to keep track of who came. So you don't have to have people sign in, um, but you do have their email addresses for later. Uh, this is, like I mentioned, the last uh, version of our annual crowdfunding campaign. We've been doing this for nine years. Um, every year we raise between thirty dollars and $40,000. It is getting harder and harder to do this kind of fundraising just with the changes in our economy, growing wealth gap. So many um, demands on people's time and money and energy and attention, especially in an election year. But um, we were successful. I wanted to show you this specifically because this is a great example of a crowdfunding campaign. So you can see we had 11 um, folks. I'm sort of the, the, the profile that got all the, the gifts directed to Station North Tool Library. But everyone else here is a volunteer, a teacher, a board member. Um, and they set their own goals. They reached out to their own communities uh, and made a really, really big impact on, on our total. Um, so you can see giving people updates is really valuable. Uh, interacting with people's comments uh, really makes a big deal. And then we didn't add a stretch goal, but I'll show you an example of a really good stretch goal where if you get close to your goal, you can say, actually, we want to raise 5,000 more and here's why. Um, but we did do some infographics that we got good uh, feedback on. So we were really specific about what we were fundraising for. Um, and part of it was that we had this grant. So of our goals for the next year, one of them was to buy all this new equipment and we had gotten this grant. So we, we included that, like we're part of the way there. Um, we got this 20,000 grant already. Um, we also try to set goals that appeal to a broad range of people. So folks who use our makerspace, people who borrow tools, um, people who care about the environmental impact of what we do. So talking about the same vision from a couple different in a couple different flavors can be really valuable too. And then we always try to be pretty transparent about our budget. Um, because donations actually make up a really small portion of our budget, people find that it is um, it's an approachable goal, right? It's not like we're throwing money into this giant hole. It's, you know, like if we if we meet our goal, we're actually solvent. We're great. That's our budget for next year. So again, focusing on positivity also includes saying that like, yeah, our goal is realistic. It's going to be impactful. This um, is the third example of how we use this. And this is for, this is just like a, a permanent donation page that we use a QR code for in our knife making shop, um, our makerspace. And this is just for people to give a donation that is directly related to how much they use the space. So we found these are really useful. Um, it's less of a campaign and more of an ongoing um, online donation option. And then um, to your point about a new campaign, um, we'll get you all of these links so you don't have to frantically open them all. Um, but this was the Denver Tool Library startup campaign. Um, so they had a flexible goal. This was Indiegogo. So this is a different platform. It was more for, it's more like Kickstarter. So it's for actual like investment. Um, whereas ours is entirely for charitable donations. Um, but they had a lot of media. So tons of videos, really compelling graphic design. Um, and a, a really great tagline. If everyone contributes, contributes a little, we can do a lot. Um, they had perks. So their platform was set up to offer perks. Ours isn't, it's not something we generally do. Um, and their mission is simple. So I thought the way that they wrote and put together this page was really compelling. Um, it's concrete, right? Here's an example, here's their actual building. They had um, really compelling perks that also were related to um, both uh, like in-person thank you events and also using the service, right? So the way that you might kickstart something is like you buy it in advance. They had this as well. So they had like a lifetime membership that you could buy as part of their initial funding push. And then I really thought this was great, right? Like what if we don't meet our entire goal? Um, this is something that often grant makers will want to hear. Um, what's your plan if you don't reach it? How are you still going to be successful? And this is another way to inject some positivity and confidence into your campaign by getting out ahead and saying like, if we raise 20 out of 30,000, we're still gonna do all this great stuff. We're just gonna wait until next year to do the other 10,000 worth. Um, this is a sort of the other end of the spectrum. This was the Toronto Tool Libraries campaign to try to stay open, right? So this is a difficult one to spin positively. Um, and you know, when an organization is in the point of needing to do this kind of campaign just to stay open, it is a very different approach to donors. It's, it's more of an urgent crisis. Um, so this is just an example of how they did things a little bit differently. 
uh, they did meet their goal though. And they included a, um, a stretch goal that you can look into, right? So they, they reached their basic goal, excellent. And now they, they pivot to positivity to the future, right? We wanna do more than just survive. Here's all the stuff we're gonna do when we raise more money. All right, so that was a brief overview. Um, and Kate included another online example in the chat. If you have your own examples of successful crowdfunding campaigns, put them in there, let's share them. Um, Tom asked, you have specific fundraising pages for other aspects of our consumables. We do. So each of our workshops has a QR code for people to contribute to consumables in that, um, in that space. And we're trying to decide if we want to do that in our library. We're not in the position of like ensuring that we have consumables in the lending library for people to use. So we kind of don't want to encourage it, but giving people the opportunity to give at any moment is definitely my philosophy. All right, I'm gonna shush and hand it over to Darren. And then at the end, we can take questions if you have them about any of the uh, content. Hey y'all, uh, so really excited to get to share um, our experience with crowdfunding. And this is largely part of our capital campaign. So crowdfunding is a portion of a, a much larger campaign for us to buy our building. Um, so excited to kind of dive into that and crowdfunding has been a really important piece of that. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to say is going to echo the basics that Liana went over. So again, like setting the vision, what do you hope to accomplish as an organization? Owning our own building is something that we had dreamed about for uh, many, many years. So when we adopted our first ever strategic plan, one of our longer term goals identified in that plan um, was that we would own our own property. Um, you know, a number of different rationales for that. Um, we've seen some pretty significant uh, increases in rent across the city of Buffalo. Uh, so really just kind of ensuring the long term sustainability of the organization through property ownership. Um, but again, you know, you can really lay the groundwork for a campaign many, many years in advance um, and sort of slowly work towards that. The other thing was up until 2022, the tool library was totally volunteer run, so we had no staff. Um, so running things like crowdfunding campaigns, but specifically something like a capital campaign, um, without staff, it can be really difficult. So we wanted to make sure that we had uh, the organizational capacity to actually manage something like that. So there's a lot of moving pieces um, that was mentioned previously, and you really need staff to keep track of those things and to follow up and to steward donors. So um, in 2023, we applied to a local foundation um, one that specifically focused on capacity building. So um, if you know anything about grant writing, um, which I'm excited to hear will be on the docket for next uh, month, people like to fund things. They don't necessarily like to fund people, um, but we were lucky that this particular funder um, focused specifically on capacity building. So we had asked them uh, for funding to bring our two part-time staff up to full-time in 2024, um, with the reasoning be that that would allow us um, a number of different things, but one of which was to launch a capital campaign to buy our building. And that was really one of my main charges headed into 2024 um, to get this campaign off the ground. Um, and again, having numbers and making the case as to why are you launching, um, why are you launching this crowdfunding campaign? Um, why are you trying to raise this money? And for us, it was just that we had seen incredible growth um, since the pandemic. Um, and so really trying to put those numbers into perspective to let potential funders um, and potential donors know like, why the time is now, like why we urgently need their support um, and why it makes sense for them to support our campaign. So these are just, um, you know, a handful of stats that we used, but I'm sure there are lots of other uh, kind of metrics that you can use. Um, again, I think, you know, I was looking through Liana's uh, fundraising toolkit webpage, which 
um, we are absolutely going to um, steal for our use as well. Really good, uh, really good stats and materials there, but lots of ways for you to measure your impact, your success. Um, so these were just a handful that we chose. Exactly, it's never stealing. <laughs> Um, the other case was that we, um, and cost savings, um, well, actually we can jump into questions at the end, um, but, um, yeah, I can share a little bit more about how we calculate that, um, at the end. Uh, the other big case was that we were operating out of a tiny, tiny, tiny space. Um, and we had seen incredible growth just in membership and number of tools where it was like, you know, we literally just didn't have the physical space to store the tools that uh, we needed. And so one of the biggest cases was, hey, we're moving to a space that is essentially four times the size of our current space. Imagine what that will allow us to do as an organization. Um, the other thing too, again, is creating a realistic timeline. Um, so I was chatting before people entered um, the Zoom just about, you know, capital campaigns can take years of planning. Um, we had been thinking about this idea, you know, since 2021, but we really hadn't done a ton of like pre-planning work around launching the campaign um, as well as launching that public component. Um, we just kind of lucked out that we found a building that really worked for us um, and that the owner was willing to do a lease to potentially own at the end of that lease. So we had, you know, kind of that timeline already built in where we had 14 months uh, to essentially, you know, start at zero and work our way uh, up to $500,000, which was the purchase price for the building. Um, so Again, if I could go back and do it all over again, if I could have double that amount of time, uh, would I? Absolutely. Um, but again, speaking to the sense of sometimes when you have that uh, that urgency, that sense of urgency, um, that does help with um, encouraging people to support your campaign. Um, and then the other thing is for people who have experience in fundraising, um, a giving pyramid is something that you always want to think about. So starting from your largest gifts and then uh, working towards, um, you know, whether or not you have one or two $50,000 get, uh, $50, gifts and then working your way to, you know, you're planning on two hundred. dollars $50 gifts and under. So really thinking about, you know, where your community um, sort of falls in this pyramid, how many gifts you can sort of expect uh, to be granted over the course of your fundraising campaign. Um, if you've run past fundraisers, you know, where have gifts sort of fallen? Um, you know, Liana talked about what their average giving, uh, what their average gift was during their annual campaign. And so looking at that data, if you have it, um, and then really thinking about, do you, are there lead gifts out there again, um, back to the one campaign that Liana pointed out where they had that $20,000 grant already secured. Um, it is really helpful, uh, to have some of those larger gifts already secured before you go public. Um, and on that, again, sort of best practice states that you should hope to raise between 50 to 75 percent of your goal before going public. Again, this is for a major capital campaign. Um, if you are doing a, a smaller scale fundraiser, this may not necessarily hold true. You know, you may just be starting from square one. That's totally fine. Um, but for these larger sorts of amounts, so whether you're buying a building you wanna add staff, you have a new program that you wanna develop. Um, they really encourage you to try to fundraise as much as you can before going public. They tend to call that the quiet phase. Um, so again, if you have donors who have donated before, if you have relationships with sponsors or local foundations, this is an opportunity to approach them before you've gone public with what the ask is, You know what you hope to accomplish, what the outcomes will be, uh, and ideally securing some of those ahead of time before you go public, before you launch that Give Butter um, campaign. 
And again, um, I'm not a fundraising professional. So we were doing a lot of this, um, you know, we were kind of learning as we went and we were really lucky. So we had basically said, okay, we're gonna launch our campaign on April 24th. And then we were working our way backwards from that date to say, okay, what larger gifts can we secure prior to that date to include in that, you know, initial amount. And so we had applied for this competitive grant through uh, two local funders um, and the final presentation was literally the night of April 23rd. So we got a phone call at 9 p.m. saying that we had won $175,000, which brought us to over 50% of our goal. So again, do I recommend waiting until the day before you launch your campaign um, to try and hit that 50 to 75% goal? Not necessarily. Um, that is just how it worked out in our case. And it's just really helpful to build that momentum that donors see, okay, you know, this ideally is going to happen. There's more reason for me to support. They're just trying to fill uh, what is essentially a much smaller gap. Um, and then again, sort of going back to just the basics of having a platform in place, having um, donation protocols in place. So we also use GiveButter. Um, we love it because it is free. Um, people can choose to pay um, a platform fee, um, but there is no cost to the organization to use it. Um, and we use GiveButter more or less as our CRM or customer relationship manager or management system. So this allows us to track every transaction that anyone has ever made through GiveButter. So you can see if someone has donated to an event, um, if they have gone to a workshop, if they have supported your annual campaign. So you get sort of that longitudinal information on how long has this person been a donor? How many times have they donated? Um, and it allows you to keep all of their contact information all in one place. So if you wanna do a direct mailing at the end of the year, or you wanna send out an email blast, you know, you can easily just export all that data right from GiveButter. Um, and that allows you to kind of have all of that um, in one place. And again, these are all things that before we launched the campaign, we were still kind of working on figuring those things out. So the more you can front load that pre-planning and just making sure that you have those processes in place, the better. Um, so it's myself and then we have uh, a, development, a development committee chair who also kind of helps steward our give butter. Um, it is a lot of work. Um, again, if you get offline donations, so if we get checks, you know, we're entering those as manual transactions. We're making sure that everyone is being acknowledged. So there is a lot of kind of data entry management um, to think about when you are launching a, a, an online campaign like this. Um, and also something that Liana pointed out, a really fantastic way to engage your board and or volunteers. So um, especially for something like a capital campaign, you absolutely need 100% buy-in from your board. We've been super lucky that literally every single one of our board members has launched a peer-to-peer -a -peer fundraising campaign as part of our capital campaign. So you'll see here, um, you know, individuals, how many supporters, how much they've been able to raise um, and it's a really great way to expand your potential network uh, of donors. Um, your board members are going to know a totally different subset uh, people than you. So again, it's super easy. Um, Liana included in their fundraising toolkit how people can set up that fundraising page. We did a quick in-person demo with our board to show them how to set it up, but it is literally you know, three or four buttons. They fill out some information. Um, and then they're able to share this both in email and then as well as online. Um, so that's been super successful for us. Uh, something that we did too before we launched our online uh, campaign is did something called network mapping. So this is just kind of an example on your left, uh, different kind of pots of people or individuals or organizations. Um, so actually having hard copies of this to print out and give to your board and fill out. Um, again, we have a working board, so we don't have individuals 
um, you know, we don't have a ton of board members who know people who can just write $1,000, $5,000 checks. Um, and I think uh, myself included have a tendency to be like, well, I don't really know anyone who I can fundraise from, or I don't know anyone who can give. Um, and again, it doesn't really matter if it's $5, $50 or $500. We all have networks that we can tap into. And we found that just doing this in-person kind of tactile exercise was actually super beneficial um, for people to really think about who are their connections, who are their network. Um, and then we were able to take that data back to our development committee uh, and really think about, okay, who is going to make those individual asks you know, to a potential sponsor or media outlets um, or even other nonprofit organizations. So highly recommend um, looking into network mapping. Again, this was just a free um, example that we found online. I'm sure there are tons of other ones out there, um, but we did this at a board meeting, had people fill that out, um, they turned them in, and then we kind of compiled that data afterwards. Uh, engaging your members. So uh, for those of you that have a super active membership base, letting people know that you're running a crowdfunding campaign. So we have signage in the shop, QR codes that people can scan. Um, but one of our board members also took the lead on actually running a video series as part of um, that capital campaign online fundraiser. So uh, we just asked people to share why they love the tool library uh, and then just share their name and say that I am the tool library. So really trying to capture like who are tool library users? Why do they use the organization? Why is this important? Um, and ideally, why should donors care about this campaign that we're putting on? Um, again, this was like a ton of work, but we had a board member who was super down to do it. He set up a, a camera in the shop for five hours on one day and was able to capture, I think, between 15 and 20 stories from individual members. Um, and again, these were just people coming in, you know, either checking tools in or checking tools out. Um, and we got a lot of really fantastic content, um, so much so that, you know, we're thinking of just incorporating this into something we do on an annual basis. Other important thing is uh, keeping your donors uh, and supporters engaged. So providing them updates as you get gifts, um, letting you letting them know that you're getting closer um, to your goal. And again, it doesn't have to be um, a huge gift. Again, just celebrating small wins, um, posting on social media, posting on your gift butter or whatever platform you choose to use. Um, and then being sure to mention all the ways that people can support, again, beyond just actually giving tangible funds, um, different ways that they can engage in that campaign. Um, and something that Liana mentioned as well is thinking about, you know, are there going to be perks for donations? Again, because we were raising a much larger amount of money, um, we put sort of the threshold at a much higher rate. So these tend to be less individual gifts and more kind of corporate philanthropic gifts but also just something to keep in mind um, if you do want to recognize gifts in different ways, what that might look like um, and being able to share that with supporters. Um, and then again, also wanting to make sure that um, the donation that an individual gives is not the last donation that they give to your organization. Um, so stewardship, a huge part of that. Uh, we put together postcards and thank you cards specifically geared towards the building, geared towards the capital campaign. Um, so we run a list of all of the donors from Give Butter. We export that to a spreadsheet, and then we basically divide and conquer between staff and board um, so that everyone, regardless of how much money they get, um, gets an individualized, uh, individualized thank you from us. Um, and just some challenges, lessons learned. Um, so we got a ton of really great positive publicity when we launched our campaign, so much so that we were kind of inundated both by new members and by tool donations. Um, and we just weren't prepared for that influx of either. So again, we saw super long wait lists. Uh, we just had you know people lined up out the door. Uh, tons of donations that were filling the basement. And so we just weren't really prepared for that. So thinking about if you are launching a major campaign like this, you know, what the impact on your day-to-day -day operations might be and planning ahead for that. Um, something that I wish we had done a little bit more of, but that right now we are just kind of playing catch up with. 
Um, and then this isn't necessarily so much on the, the crowdfunding side of things, but we have found it um, that some funders don't sort of see the difference between tool libraries and tool rentals. So being ready uh, and willing to educate people on what the difference is are and kind of the importance of the sharing economy and tool libraries as a piece of that. Okay, I think we had some really fantastic questions in the chat. Um, so Anne Andreas, asks what does cost savings mean? So for us, uh, we have a replacement cost that we put into my turn for every tool. And then we go through at the end of the year and calculate out individual unique loans of tools by members. And then we'll tally that up uh, with that replacement cost. So that gives us an approximate amount of money that people have saved by borrowing rather than buying. Um, so we do try to remove things like renewals, things like the same member taking the same tool out multiple times. Um, so it gives us kind of an approximation of, okay, if everyone had gone out and bought what they borrowed from us, like what would that amount be? Um, and we find that to be a really powerful metric for us. Us too. Um, and in fact, we didn't have that information for the first 12 years, um, but we just got uh, an intern to catalog everything. So I'm really excited to use that in our fundraising campaign this fall. Um, and I'm definitely going to borrow from how you did it too. Uh, Cami asked, what about very early stage groups that aren't 501c3s yet? Um, so again, I think session three on operations is a good place to start. Um, but fiscal sponsorship, yes, is a really good option for a group that's just starting out. And that's when you um, approach a larger nonprofit. There are groups that exclusively do fiscal sponsorships. Many times a community foundation or a funders network will also fiscally sponsor you. Um, that is willing to sort of like be your umbrella organization. So you would become a program of that nonprofit. You would fundraise under their 501c3 designation. They would handle your money for you, provide a lot of other business services generally. Um, there's more about fiscal sponsorship in unit three, but I would highly, highly, highly recommend finding some entity to collect money under um, because unless it is all cash that is going to get taxed um, and I have I have known people who have sort of you know had a GoFundMe or whatever go into their bank account and then they get a 1099 statement from GoFundMe for thirty thousand dollars of income so um, yes definitely try to find a nonprofit to hold your money and I will mention we were under another nonprofit from 2011 to 2017, um, and it was only until we basically our budget underneath them was larger than their organizational budget that they were like, okay, I think it's time for you to like leave the nest. Yeah, same. We were fiscally sponsored for 10 whole years, um, and it was fine until we realized that the percentage that they were taking was just like way more money than what we were getting in return. Any other questions? Did we time it perfectly? agreement. Um, every fiscal sponsor is going to have their own contract. If a fiscal sponsor does not offer you um, a legal contract, they are not a good fiscal sponsor. Um, I can put our fiscal sponsorship agreement in, um, and I don't know if we can still add it back to that operations um, module, but it's, it's generally has to do with what services they're providing in terms of like financial statements, um, the frequency of those statements, that's very important. And then how much of their revenue, of your revenue, they are taking in exchange. Um, so di difference from a tool rental, I think really just the fact that tool libraries aren't transactional by nature. And so it is more about a community-based organization focused on providing everyone access, regardless of background, um, you know, ability to pay. So 
tool rental is transactional. If you can't afford to rent the tool, then you don't have access to it. Whereas tool libraries, you know, by nature are about accessibility. Um, I think it's also, you know, at a larger kind of um, level, yeah. just about power and, you know, equity and who has power and who is able to do things. And so again, tool libraries are really about, um, being an equalizer where everyone has access to the same things. Um, and then again, I think beyond just the tool borrowing, if you do have programs that you offer, so workshops, um, repair cafes, those sorts of things, you know, what are you providing to the community beyond just, you know, people being able to borrow tools? Um, and then I think also, you know, being able to capture things that your members have said. So, on you know, many, many occasions we have people who come in who are like, I literally wouldn't have been able to do this project without the tool library. So um, just being able to share sort of those, those quotes, those case studies with funders, I think can be really helpful. Um, but it also just goes to show, you know, some funders have never had to worry about going to Home Depot and dropping $500 because their basement flooded or, you know, it just, uh, I think it reflects a mentality of people with uh, money who have never had to go without. So doing that as diplomatically and kindly as possible. One of the things that stuck out to me early on was that, um, you know, the idea that people give to people, not to organizations. And I think that's a, uh, that bridges with, uh, people give the people not to organizations, but they also, you know, give towards an outcome. So it's that, as, as you also laid out. So it's that that kind of bridging of those things together, um, which reinforces the ability to raise money on things that don't yet exist. If you're able to make a compelling need, as somebody, again, this is mentioned earlier, but if if you basically are able to lay out like, hey. There is this need. Um, it it's it's a need that's not being met. This is a proven way to meet it. And for X, Y, and Z reasons, myself and our team are the right people to be able to do this and to be able to meet that need with your support and with the support of the community as a whole. And so bridging, basically bringing people in for their role as a as a funder, as a contributor, um, to be both supporting you to do the work, but for that outcome to be achieved. And if you're able to bridge all those together in a two minute pitch or less, you're in a good position when you get a chance to talk to somebody. And then, and then you have a conversation about what the nuances of, of, of doing it, what it will actually take um, and how other groups have been able to, to pull it off in the past, which this series hopefully should help you out, make, help you make the case. Uh, now that we've got all these great case studies. So we are right here at the at the the hour. Um, Want to thank everybody for joining us, and especially for Liana and Darren for coming and sharing their experience with us. Um, also, want to thank everybody who has been contributing questions and suggestions in the chat. We are saving this chat, um, so if there's links that you missed, all of all everything in the chat is going to end up getting uh, posted onto Canvas and uh, Candice who's had to, had to hop out um, a little bit early today, will be sending out a message to everybody who registered for this session um, once these resources are up there to be able to access again and, and to, to share um, with others in your communities and groups. And also, if you just scroll back up the chat, you'll see that we posted the flyer for the next session, which um, will be on Tuesday, October 8th. Um, just had to remember the date for that one. Uh, same time, same place. Uh, Amanda Miller and uh, another presenter yet to be confirmed will be presenting that session. Um, and feel free to please invite others. Uh, if there's other people in your community that you're working on that you're trying to get something going or that are um, working on your existing libraries of things um, and you want to bring other people to help support the the fundraising. That's a great way to enroll them into getting more involved in that by showing up to sessions like these. So thank you all for joining and look forward to seeing you again. And as I mentioned, we'll keep the room open for another 10 minutes or so 
uh, in case anyone wants to stick around and, and chat about fundraising or other things related to LOTs. Anyone happens to be 